Hi, I'm Sherry. Welcome to my channel. I hope your new year is getting off to a great start. I thought it would be fun to start 2022 with a look back at some of my best DIY projects of the past year. I selected the projects based on your comments, so you'll have to let me know whether I included your personal favorite. I also included some of my biggest flops of 2021. So if you want to see those, be sure to stick around until the end. Well, I have over 20 projects to show you today. So let's get started. Number 20 is a thrift flip of some cheap coasters that I picked up in Arizona while visiting family. I went over the images with my orbital sander and then I applied two thin coats of Zinsser primer. I measured the coasters and then printed out images of vintage library cards to fit. I applied Mod Podge both to the coaster and to the back of the image. When you do this, it allows you a little bit of time to adjust the image on the surface and get it lined up just right. When the Mod Podge was dry, I applied three separate thin layers of a clear top coat. I sanded the edges a bit to smooth them out. I also painted a crate from Dollar Tree and attached a little public library sign to hold the coasters. You can find links to all of these images in the description box below. Number 19 is a hanging frame that I created using parts from a broken chair. I had two shorter spindles left that had supported the chair's armrests, and I wanted to use them to create some kind of unique picture frame. I drilled a large hole near the top of each spindle. I then took a spindle from the magazine rack and using wood glue, I attached the smaller spindle to the two holes in the larger spindles. Even though you see me using super glue here, it didn't take to the older, unfinished piece of scrap wood. So ultimately, I did use wood glue. Then I painted the entire piece with two coats of white chalk paint. I also painted a picture frame from Dollar Tree. I printed out one of my favorite quotes to put in the frame. I drilled two small holes along the top of the frame and then screwed in two eye hooks. I ran twine through the eye hooks and then tied the frame to the smaller spindle. I think this is a fun way to display a favorite quote or a favorite photo. I'm going to have to hunt down some more spindles because I really want to make another one of these and paint it green so I can put it in my kitchen. Number 18 is a unique way to hide your remote controls or other coffee table clutter. Let's make a book out of an old box. This one happens to be a jewelry box that I purchased for a couple dollars at Goodwill. First, I removed all of the hardware, and then I painted it with two coats of ivory chalk paint. I wanted my book to be the Canterbury Tales, the book that was the inspiration for the name of this channel. So I found an image of a book cover that I liked, and then I printed it out in the size of the top of my jewelry box. I took pictures of the sides of an old book that I had and then printed these images out to fit the sides of the jewelry box. I decoupaged the sides onto the box first and let the Mod Podge dry. When the Mod Podge was thoroughly dry, I went along all of the edges with a utility knife to cut off the extra paper. I also cut along the bottom edge of the lid on all three sides so the box would actually open again. 
Then I decoupaged my book cover to the top of the box, putting Mod Podge on both the jewelry box and on the piece of paper. I had to splice several images together to create a book spine image that was wide enough to cover the back of my box. When the Mod Podge was thoroughly dry and all the edges trimmed, I went over the entire box with another coat of Mod Podge. I know these book storage boxes are easy to find in stores, but I like mine better. It's more realistic looking and it's personalized. Number 17 was inspired by something I saw at the silos in Waco, Texas. I absolutely fell in love with these framed preserved florals at Magnolia, but there was no way I was going to spend $300 or even $200 on one. So I cut some flowers from my yard. I pressed them between sheets of parchment paper. I pressed down with an iron and held it for 15 seconds and then moved to a new spot and held that for 15 seconds. And I just kept repeating that process until I felt like the flowers were completely dried out. I found two matching frames at Goodwill for under $3 each that had that vintage look that I was going for. I pulled out the cardboard and the print, and then I flipped the print over so that the white side was facing up. I cut out a cheap piece of cotton fabric that I had, just slightly larger than the piece of cardboard. I folded the fabric around the edges of the cardboard and held it in place using glue stick. I cut small strips of black electrical tape to hold down the flowers and to give it that vintage botanical look. I printed out these vintage botanical labels, which I'll have linked in my description box. I attached those with glue stick as well. Before framing, I needed to vacuum up some of the crumbs that were coming off of the plant. I used brown paper tape to hold the cardboard in place, and I reattached the brown paper that I had cut off initially. So I will not be selling these in my booth because I absolutely love, 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 love how these turned out. Mine may not be genuinely vintage, but they only cost $3, not $300. Number 15 and 16 were two of my most popular decoupaging projects of the year. Before spray painting the ceramic rabbit, I covered its eyes with painter's tape and used an X-Acto knife to cut around the edges. Bullseye Spray Primer is amazing. It covers just about everything in just one coat. I decided to use paper napkins to decoupage the ceramic canister and the rabbit. To do this, you'll need to tear apart the two plies of the napkin using only the top pattern part. Cover the item that you are decoupaging completely with a thin coat of Mod Podge. Begin applying the napkin to the Mod Podge. Smooth it out and try to avoid wrinkles, but you will not be able to avoid all wrinkles. It is just impossible. For small items, tear off little pieces of napkin to create a design you like. To seal the piece, go back over everything with another coat of Mod Podge. On the rabbit, some spray paint seeped under the tape on the eyes, and I needed to touch them up with a Sharpie marker. I really love how these two projects turned out, especially the rabbit. I'll be sure to link the fern napkins that I used if they are still available. Number 14 comes from my first ever dupe video where I tried to duplicate expensive home decor I saw at a local store. 
After spray painting both the leaf and the bird in a metallic spray paint, I used E6000 to attach the bird to the leaf. To mimic the Jeffrey Allen tray, I took a Gave chalk paint, applied it, and rubbed it off. I kept doing this process until I got a look that I liked. After the first coat of blue paint had dried, I came back in and added more in the center of the leaf. I was really pleased with how this tray turned out, and I think it was a great match to the Jeffrey Allens for a lot less money. The next project comes from my second dupes video, where I copied things I had seen at Kirkland's. I wanted to try to dupe this beaded basket. I didn't have an exact match, so I decided to go with this larger rectangular basket that I had. I took off the handles and set them aside. Rather than purchasing new, I decided to use these darker beads that I already had. I strung them on a long piece of florist wire. Using a large needle and a piece of wire, I began sewing the string of beads to the top of the basket. I would tie off the piece of wire every third or fourth bead. I continued to do this all around the top of the basket until I got back to the start. I removed some extra beads off the end of the strand to create a perfect fit. I went back around the basket with my wire cutters to trim off any little pieces of wire that were sticking out. I think this would be really cute if it was painted white or another color, but for now I'm just going to leave it natural. Number 12 comes from my first ever collaboration video where we were required to use something blue, and I chose this large thrifted atlas that I purchased for only $3. I decided to combine it with this flimsy end table that I also purchased for $3. I unscrewed the tabletop, which was actually a picture frame. Originally, I was going to attach the book to the table frame, but on closer inspection, I decided that the table was just too small for the large atlas. So I decided to use just the legs and build a new apron box to attach the legs to. I measured the length and width of the book and then subtracted two inches from each of those measurements to determine the length of the wood I needed to cut. I then cut four pieces of scrap wood. I used wood glue to assemble the apron box, and then I used super glue to adhere the apron box to the bottom side of the book. I weighted it down with some other books I had on hand, and I let the glue dry overnight. The next day, I attached the legs using wood screws. I used a countersink drill bit so that the screws would sit just below the level of the wood. Then I could cover over them with some wood fill, which I sanded smooth before I started painting. I applied two coats of coastal blue chalk paint. When the paint was dry, I lightly distressed the edges of the legs and the apron with 220 grit sandpaper and then I applied a coat of antiquing wax, wiping off the excess with a rag. To add even more interest to the table, I found some other large books I had around the house and sat them on top of the atlas, and then I took an old belt and strapped it around all of the books. Another popular project from that same collaboration video involved an old suitcase that I had thrifted in Door County, Wisconsin, and I decided to turn it into a clock of sorts. I found a wall clock in my stash that had wood blocks attached to the back. I held the clock against the suitcase in the spot where I wanted it to go, and I marked in pencil where the wood blocks were located so that I could cut a hole because I wanted the clock to sit flush with the wall of the suitcase. 
I drilled a couple large holes so that I would have starting points for my jigsaw, which I used to cut out a small square for the back of the clock to fit in. I removed the front of the clock from the back because I wanted to paint the wood frame black to match the suitcase. I painted the frame with a couple coats of black chalk paint. When the paint was dry, I distressed it a bit with 220 grit sandpaper. I chose not to wax it because I wanted the wood to be as matte as the suitcase was. I created a quote in vinyl on my Cricut machine, which I applied to the side of the suitcase. The vinyl was really not sticking as well as I would have liked, so I went over it with my hair blow dryer for a few minutes, which seemed to help the letters to stick better. Because I can change out the batteries from the inside of the suitcase, I just hot glued the wood frame on. I found an old luggage tag inside the suitcase, and I decided to tie it on the handle for additional decoration. When I started making this, I had every intention of selling it in my retail booth, but when I finished, I liked it so much that I decided to keep it, at least for now. Number 10 on the list was a fun little project involving a gumball machine. To begin, remove the large screw at the top of the gumball machine. Remove the lid, the glass globe, and all the inner plastic pieces. At this point, the base will also slide off. I filled the base with hard styrofoam and a variety of succulents purchased at Walmart and Dollar Tree. I then covered the styrofoam with some reindeer moss. To reassemble, I first put the base back in with its skinny metal rod sticking up through the styrofoam. At this point, I decided to hot glue the transparent portion of a Dollar Tree butterfly sticker to the metal rod. I replaced the glass globe and the lid with its plastic insert, and then I tightened the top screw. To add some extra whimsy, I hot glued some succulents to appear as if they were growing out of both the coin slot and the gumball dispenser area. I think the gumball terrarium is a fun element in my library, which otherwise looks very serious. My projects involving clay in my first Magnolia Dupes video come in at number nine on the list. Using oven-baked clay, I created four handful-sized balls of clay. I then rolled out each ball using an old glass vase as my roller. For two of the coasters, I used real flowers from my yard, and for two of the coasters, I used plastic plants. I laid the plant on top of the clay and then rolled over it just once or twice, and then I carefully peeled it away from the clay. The real flowers did tend to leave tiny little bits in the clay, which I dug out using my Cricut tools. I used an old metal lid to cut out a perfect circle, and then I used my Cricut tools again just to clean up the edges a bit. The clay stuck a bit to my wood cutting board, so I would recommend using something plastic, glass, or metal instead. I baked them for 15 minutes at 275 degrees Fahrenheit. Oven-baked clay does not need a sealer, and I'm glad because I like the matte, natural look of these coasters. In that same video, I made this wall pocket using oven-baked clay. And in my second Magnolia video, I duped these wall plaques using a piece of sheetrock and joint compound. The next project is the only somewhat holiday-related one that I included in this video. You'll need an old alarm clock. I see them quite frequently at my thrift store. Unscrew the back, then you'll be able to easily remove the bells, 
the mechanics and the clock face. I also removed the piece of glass. I spray painted the body of the clock orange and the bells and handle green. I cut a new back plate for the clock out of a piece of scrap cardboard and then I covered it with a piece of scrapbook paper attaching it with glue stick. I went around the inner edge of the clock with hot glue to attach the piece of cardboard. Then I hot glued a small piece of styrofoam on the inside bottom of the clock. I attached some small pieces of skewer sticks to some Dollar Tree velvet pumpkins and stuck them in the styrofoam. I cut some stems off of another little floral bush that I had and stuck those in and then added some Spanish moss to fill in any empty spots. As a final touch, I added a little wooden mouse that I had in my stash. I added a little gingham bow and I was done. This cost me less than $5 total and I think it turned out super cute. I'm definitely going to be looking for more alarm clocks at the thrift store. In my video on uses for old picture frames, the smallest frame that I used also happened to be one of the most popular. For this project, you'll need a small frame, a small piece of fabric, and a little pillow stuffing. Center your fabric and then your stuffing over your frame. Begin pushing the fabric and the stuffing through the opening in the frame until you create a nice size bubble on the front side of the frame. Fold the extra fabric over onto the stuffing and hot glue it in place. Trim off any excess fabric as needed. Then take the cardboard backing from the frame and hot glue it back into place. Now you have a pincushion that is cute enough to leave sitting out on a shelf all the time. Number six is another frame from that same video. For the next project, you're going to need a large branch or piece of driftwood. Find an empty frame and use a pencil to mark where you would like the piece of wood to go. I used my jigsaw to remove this piece of frame. You didn't see that coming, did ya? Paint your frame in a tone of brown or green paint. Lightly distress it if you like, but don't apply wax. You'll see why in a minute. Use wood glue or super glue to attach the piece of wood to the opening in your frame. Sometimes sanding where the wood is going to touch the frame will help it to stick better. I added additional super glue along the edges to make sure that it stayed attached. Cut some wire tape to add some extra interest to the frame. I believe I got this tape at Hobby Lobby. Form the tape over and into the shape of your piece of wood, cutting it if necessary. Hot glue the metal tape into place. The glue will heat up the metal tape, so be careful when pressing it in place. Hot glue metal tape to all four sides of the front of your frame. Clean up any hot glue that squished out from under the tape, and then paint the tape the same color as your frame. Distress it a bit and then apply a coat of antiquing wax, dabbing off the extra wax. While the wax is still wet, sprinkle cinnamon over the entire frame. Rub or brush off the excess cinnamon. You can apply a second coat of cinnamon if you want an even crustier, rustier look. I printed out an image of an oak tree and attached that to the top corner of the frame. Number five involves one of my most popular ideas repurposing old electrical lights. Originally, I was just going to refinish the wood on this $4 Lazy Susan. But then I thought it might make a nice tabletop 
for this old wood lamp I had. I started by cutting off the cord and then I removed the large bolt on the underside and just continued to remove things to gut the entire lamp. There were two holes in the base of the lamp that I filled with the Loctite putty. The putty dry for a few hours. I painted the lamp with two separate coats of white chalk paint. I used my orbital sander to sand down the putty patches on the base and then painted it with two coats of the white chalk paint. I found a dowel rod that I could sand down a bit to fit into the hole at the base of the lamp. I put a little bit of construction adhesive on it and then hammered it in place. I used a handsaw to cut off the excess dowel rod. I drilled a pilot hole for a screw. I then applied some construction adhesive and reattached the brass base of the lamp, including the concrete insert that you find in the base of many lamps. I distressed the lamp using a medium grit sandpaper and then I applied a paste wax to seal and protect the chalk paint. I removed the base of the Lazy Susan and saved it for another project. Using my orbital sander, I sanded the top piece down to the bare wood. Like I had done on the bottom of the lamp, I filled the hole on the top with a piece of dowel rod, intending to screw the Lazy Susan to the top but instead I decided just to use wood glue to attach the two pieces together. I weighted it down and let it dry overnight. I applied a coat of paste wax and then decided it might look better with a little bit of antiquing wax. I wiped the majority of it off, leaving just a little bit behind. To protect the surface of the wood round, I applied a coat of water-based polycrylic. This seals the wood and protects against liquid spills. Number four also involved gutting an electrical light fixture, this time a large chandelier. I bought this large chandelier at the Habitat Restore for $35 and I'm going to turn it into a planter. I took off the top part by unscrewing several nuts. This allowed me to remove the inner portion that held the light bulbs. I reassembled the top section and on the underside, instead of returning the nut, I used the finial from the ceiling cover so that I would have a circle on which to hang a basket. I took it outside and gave it a couple coats of the black spray paint with the rust protection, and then it was ready for a giant fern. I think it makes a very interesting planter. I also made a wind chime and a light with citronella candles using the leftover chandelier parts. Number three also involves a light, only this time I didn't remove the electrical wiring. After seeing me upcycle a glass lamp like this in a recent video, a friend thought I might like to have another one. After sealing it in a garbage sack, I broke off all of the glass and threw it away. I cleaned it really well and gave it two coats of matte black spray paint. Be sure to tape off the socket and the cord before you start painting. Pull the socket cover out of its base. You may need to use a screwdriver to loosen it up a bit. You will see two screws holding down wires. Loosen them up a bit and pull out the wires. You can now slide off any other parts that are on the metal rod. Using a drill bit just slightly larger than the metal rod of the lamp, drill a hole in the center of several books. Because it stuck out a bit, I sanded down the edges of the hole on each side. 
The number of books you'll need will depend on the length of that metal rod. I added one book at a time until I reached the height that I needed. I played around with the sizes and the colors of the books to create a stack of books that I found visually pleasing. For my last book, I printed out this image of Canterbury Cathedral and decoupaged it to the cover of an old thesaurus. This is the only book cover that you can fully see on the lamp. Return any lamp parts that you slid off the metal rod earlier. The last piece should be the harp holder, and then you tighten the nut to hold all of these pieces in place. Pull the wires through the socket base, and then screw the base to the metal rod. Wrap the wires around the socket screws, and then tighten them. Replace the socket cover. Push the socket back into the base while simultaneously gently pulling on the cord from the base of the lamp. Reattach the harp if your lampshade requires one. I found this shade for only $2.99 at Goodwill. It was the perfect size for this lamp. I have wanted to make a lamp like this for the longest time, and I don't know what I was waiting for. It was so much easier than I thought it would be. The top two projects of the year both came from my tear tray video. You're going to need a small thrifted alarm clock. Begin by unscrewing any screws that you see, and then begin disassembling the clock. We're only going to be using the body piece so you can get rid of everything else. You'll need two small blocks of wood, one for the base and one for the back. The back should be a little taller than the clock. Super glue these pieces together. Super glue your glass or clear plastic piece back into the face of the clock. Print out this vintage scale face image to fit inside your clock. Place it in against the glass, and then I used a little hot glue around the edges to hold it in place. Super glue two small wood blocks to the back wood block, and then glue a large metal lid from a canister to the two small blocks. Cover the glass clock face with some painter's tape and then give it a couple coats of black spray paint. When the paint was dry, I decided to distress it a bit with some sandpaper. The super glue spray accelerator actually caused some discoloration of my plastic clock face but I didn't mind because I thought it added to the vintage appearance of the scale. And now my best DIY project of 2021. For the next project, I cut up a couple old paperback books into smaller rectangles using my miter saw. If you don't have a miter saw, you can cut your books with scissors or a utility knife. It just takes a little longer. If you use a miter saw, you'll probably want to sand down the frayed edges a bit. To create covers for my three miniature books, I cut some blank pages out of another old book to print my images on. I taped the pages to a piece of cardstock, and then I selected the images I wanted to use. The New York Public Library has an endless selection of book images. I'll link the ones I used in the description box below. After cutting out the images, I applied a thin coat of Mod Podge to the back of each image and then adhered them to the top of each miniature book. Smooth out any wrinkles and trim up the edges as needed. I wouldn't recommend applying a top coat of Mod Podge as the paper is likely to wrinkle and it's just not really needed. 
Style your books however you like. I tied mine together using some ivory lace from Dollar Tree. These turned out even better than I hoped. I don't think you can tell that these are not the actual books they appear to be. And now a couple projects that didn't turn out the way I had hoped. Even though I applied several coats of polyurethane to this cooler table, by the end of the summer, the wood was warped and splitting, and I ended up pitching it. Many of you thought the hot glue I used to attach the fringe to my patio umbrella would not hold up to the heat of summer, but let me tell you, that Gorilla hot glue is a wonder. My umbrella still looked perfect when I packed it away for the winter. Although my first Magnolia Dupes video is my most watched video of the year, it also contains what I consider my biggest flop. I saw these beautiful woven light pendants at Magnolia and thought that I could reproduce them using a lampshade and some yarn. I spent hour upon hour slaving over that lampshade, and I absolutely hated the end result. In fact, I disliked it so much that I threw it away. I hope you saw your favorite project in today's video. But if you didn't, I would love to know what it is. Well, that's all for today. I've got a good old-fashioned thrift flip planned for next Tuesday, so I hope you'll come back then. Bye-bye for now. Mm -hmm.